Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update. Probably going to be the first one for the 30th of August 2024. I'm going to schedule this to drop in the middle of the night or sometime after midnight because too much... Uh, too much content in one day is not really great. But on the other hand, I the news never stops. And I've got to you know, relay this content to you because otherwise it'll just be, I, I, I collate it, get it ready, and then it'll just get replaced by other news coming in. So here it is. It's not going to be hugely long today, this one. Uh, we're going to start with Hungary and the EU. Uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, having a spat. So a spat between the EU's foreign policy chief and Hungary has unfurled at a meeting of EU foreign ministers on Thursday. So that's today diverting, or will be yesterday when you hear this, diverting attention from key issues such as the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. Now, this is a shame, but it's also, it's not a problem for issues between Ukraine and and Hungary, it's a reflection of those issues, I would imagine. So Kaleba's appeal and Joseph Perel from the EU's earlier advocacy of giving Kiev a free hand in using the Western donated armaments was supported by France, Sweden, Latvia and the Netherlands and Poland in the no camp, mm, Slovakia, who knew? Uh, so anyway, Hungary, EU blop, overshadows key meeting on Ukraine. Top Brussels diplomat Joseph Borrell's comments on Ukraine and the Middle East anger Budapest, and probably for good reason. So he's advocating a lifting of restrictions, uh, US restrictions in particular. I think the EU is starting to get more and more, well, Germany aside, the rest of the EU seem to be more and more, uh, at least, the, I said the rest of the EU, okay, not Germany because they are anti-escalation and not Hungary and Slovakia. But otherwise, there seems to be general support for Ukraine being able to do what they need to win the war, to, to do better than they presently are by, for example, striking further into Russia. Now, the Kursk incursion into Russia by the Ukrainians is an example of Ukraine's right to self-defense, according to the Latvian foreign minister. Quote, Ukrainians have been very, very careful and very, very diligent not to be going after civilians in Kursk or Blast, uh, in not doing what Russians have been doing to the U on Ukrainian territory. Uh, this is a normal military Counter, counteraction. So this counteroffensive, in our view, is also covered by the right to self-defense, according to by the Braves. And I think, or Braza, or whatever her, her name is pronounced, uh, I don't know, I'm not too good on Latvian. But um, yeah, absolutely spot on. And I think there is this distinction between the way that Ukraine operates in Russia and uh, the difference between how Russia operates in Ukraine, committing countless war crimes and going about things uh, in a very legal sense concerning the laws of war. Right, Pavel Durov, the CEO of Telegram with uh, a, a French citizenship but Russian, uh, Durov will not be able to leave France during the investigation into him. The court has confiscated all of his passports. The Paris court seized his passports during the investigation which were in his possession at the time of detention. This is reported by the Russian TASS news agency. Uh, of course, he's being charged, uh, placed under judicial supervision, although he's been le let free but he's still under investigation uh, and obviously can't go anywhere. Now, it's interesting that Russian propagandists have been talking about how he can be broken out of French, uh, out of France, effectively, talking about like masterminding some escape for him. This is how important Durov is, I think, for the Russians and the Russian war effort. European Commission, according to Financial Times, has launched a technical investigation against Telegram. Uh, the agency suspects that the messenger may have underestimated the number of users in the EU to avoid meeting strict requirements for large online platforms such as restrictions on advertising, measures against misinformation and protection of minors. Telegram reported 41 million users in February and has not updated that data since. Failure to provide updated data could also mean that Telegram is violating the law, the publication said. So Telegram is in trouble either way by the looks of it, no matter, no matter what happens with regard to the investigation into uh, the complicity and allegations and all the other ones that we, we've heard, it, it, it's clear that I think Telegram is going to get at least a rather large rap on the knuckles. Now, Olaf Scholz of Germany has, has assured that despite recent attempts to sow doubts about the country's willingness to provide uh, support for Kiev, Germany will continue to provide it financial, economic, political and military support 
uh, as long as Ukraine needs it. Uh, indeed, UK and Germany have signed a declaration promising to sustain quotes of support, support to Ukraine and boosting European defence. The declaration comes after German media leaked Berlin's plans to cut new Ukrainian aid next year. So I, I think the cutting aid to Ukraine was probably misunderstood to some degree uh, and is largely what they do anyway, but also there are elements of that which are problematic. So six and one and a half a dozen in the other. Now, De Spiegel is staying on Germany and talking about support and maybe elements of of an obstacle to continued support to Ukraine. De Spiegel reports that the sus- suspect in a Nord Stream's bonnet bombing fled from Poland to Ukraine in a Ukrainian embassy car. So at the end of May 2024, just a few days before the Federal Court Chamber of Germany issued an arrest warrant for the alleged participant in the Nord Stream's bombings, bombing, a citizen of Ukraine, Vladimir Z, whoever that might be, was travelling freely in Europe and even stopped in Berlin, according to the material, uh, the uh, media uh, source Der Spiegel. According to sources, on May the 22nd, Vladimir Z, uh, together with his family, went on a small trip in a car by car in Europe. At the time when they stopped in Berlin, the Ukrainian suspect, quote, was already in the crosshairs of the prosecutor's office and intelligence services in Germany. According to the article, however, they did not have an arrest warrant at the time. Vladimir Z was put on the European wanted list in early June, and on the 21st, the warrant was sent to Poland. In response, the Polish prosecutor's office promised Germany to immediately arrest the suspect, but on July the 6th, he managed to leave the territory of Poland and enter Ukraine, the sources said in Berlin. As noted in the article, it is certain that Warsaw warned Vladimir Z about criminal prosecution in advance, and Polish colleagues were not going to arrest him as they considered him a hero. So this is quite an interesting thing. So the Nord Stream pipelines, if it was the Ukrainians behind it, and I know some people are dead against that being the case, possibly because of an inherent desire to exonerate Ukraine from everything, and and others who are who are fine with Ukraine doing it, saying it's it's a legitimate act of or a, a, legit, a legitimate act within the context of the war. Or there are those who are saying, right, we're on Ukraine's side, but that sucks and that shouldn't have happened. There are different ways of interpreting what took place. And those are like, I don't have enough information. I don't really know. I'm going to wait until there is more information forthcoming. But it, yeah, you you will react in many different ways to this. But in Poland, it was seen as like the bombing of Nord Stream. If it was done by a Ukrainian or by the Ukrainians, then this is seen as slightly in a slightly more... Uh, popular light, I guess, than in Germany. The end result was broadly good, right? So it is good that the Nord Stream, this is my interpretation, the outcome that, that the Nord Stream pipeline was, was destroyed is a good outcome for Europe and a good outcome for uh, stopping Russia from making so much money and therefore funding their war even more. So I think... Uh, <laughs> This is moral consequentialism, which is doing an evil for a greater good, right? And it, and it is a very common form of moral evaluation. It was, it, it's in fact what almost all people um, rationally assent to, even if it intuitively they sometimes have a problem with it. Okay, how do I explain? Okay, I don't want to get too philosophical, but there's a very famous thought experiment in moral philosophy called the trolley experiment. Uh, that uh, an English philosophical woman dreamt up a hundred years ago, or whatever, and it wasn't that long ago, but um, was it the fifties? Anyway, the idea is you've got a trolley, runaway trolley on a railway track, and it's going to run over five people, and you are standing in front of a lever. And if you pull the lever, it diverts a trolley to a track that only kills one person. Turns out that something like 89% of people would pull the lever so it diverts from killing five to kill one. In other words, you are okay with it killing one person and you being responsible for killing one person in a sense uh, because it saves five people. In other words, you'll do a bad for a greater good. Right? That's moral consequence- consequentialism. The consequences of any action beget its moral value. And of course, that becomes very complicated because when do you measure the consequences? In in what way do you measure it? There are loads of complications with this and then loads of refinements. And it's been refined and complicated, refined and complicated as a moral value system anyway. Most people 
according to research, would pull the lever. However, if you change it to pushing a, a supposedly pushing a fat man off the bridge, the idea is that that person is big enough that when they fall on a the track, they would die, but it would stop the trolley and save five people. And the idea is that you, instead of pulling the lever, you are pushing someone. So there's a there's this psychological element involved here that when that's the case, and it's exactly the same moral calculation, but with an added psychological variable, that the, that the percentages get reversed. So instead of 89% of people pulling the lever, 89% like of people would not push that person. In other words, we are rationally consequentialist, but intuitively in certain situations, we'd have a problem with that. For example, we can press a button to release a, a, a nuclear warhead or an atom bomb on Hiroshima it's far easier to do that than to walk up to 100,000 people and kill them individually right so there's a psychological element to morality that isn't always understood through when we do the calculations rationally so yep I'm going to do this to do that I'm going to kill 100,000 people to save uh, you know five million people in a, in the second world war yeah but okay now go and do that like one by one and do that person to person mm, yeah not too not too sure about that now okay so psychology is important in morality okay that said you know how how you interpret you know what i'm trying to do is explain that people will have different reactions to uh whether this was a, the right thing to do or a good thing to do depending on what their objectives are what 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 their moral value systems are whether they assent to some kind of moral consequentialism or some other form of moral value system you know you can have a deontology or some kind of kantian categorical imperative so Immanuel kant said it's just categorically wrong to do certain things irrespective so it's wrong to lie I mean, then you say well is it always wrong to lie so if a, a child murderer came this is called the inquiring murderer thought experiment if a child murderer came to my door and said where's Jack and Jill and I know Jack and Jill are up in the upstairs playing and I'm like hmm I don't know where Jack and Jill are I think I saw them to five blocks down the road like that's a lie but that's saving those two people's lives so actually that's a lie for a greater good now that's intuitively seems to be the right thing to do but Kant would say you should never lie lie is always wrong it's a categorical imperative that you do not lie so if that's your moral value system, then blowing up Ukraine, blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines is always going to be wrong. But if you're like, yeah, you can do some bad things to achieve greater goods, then you might interpret that as being right. So have a think about how you do morality and how you work out what is right and wrong before just just going headlong into an intuitive reaction knowing that also moral intuition and moral psychology is also an important component of how we evaluate things in the world that's the philosophy part out of the way let's go on and do some geopolitics okay international paralympic committee first rejected ukraine's uniforms for the 2024 paralympic games objecting to the inclusion of crimea this is absolutely disgusting objecting to the inclusion of crimea on the map and the green military colour calls the uniforms too political. After two months of pushback, Ukraine won the right to keep the design intact. Good stuff. So now this is what their um, Paralympics uh, uniform, if you like, looks like. And it does include Crimea. And I would say rightly. So, um, yeah, interesting. It's got that green on. That is interesting. But, you know, there you go. Uh, right. Uh, Jane Kiev says, not bathing in naive unicorn land like the Western policymakers that forbid Ukraine from striking Russian territory, 60% of Ukrainians rightly understand that even after this war resolu war's resolution, Russia will attack again uh, into Ukraine. So Russians can't help what they are, he says. Uh, you could argue that's a simplistic view of Russia, or you could say it's accurate. Uh, Ukrenska Pravda reports that a from a survey, almost 60% of Ukrainians are convinced that after the end of the war, the Russian Federation will attack Ukraine again. Interesting. And I, I often think about, is the UK doing enough to help Ukraine? Can't we give some more stuff? Uh, but then I'm also very cognizant that, that the UK is in a really challenging financial position. So just to let those abroad know, and this might be a little bit of a UK-centric part of this video, 
But we've had a change in government. We had the Conservatives ruling for 14 years and then Labour took over and Labour knew before the election that there was going to be no money, which is why they didn't want to overpromise so that they would end up under delivering. They didn't want to promise people stuff that would, would they'll be held accountable for by looking at their manifestos. So they were quite vague and they were worried. They were They were going to make bigger claims, supposedly. They were going to make bigger like um, plans after getting in if there was money there. But it turns out that there was not money there. There is no money left. There is a £22 billion black hole in the UK uh, treasury. And actually, it's worse than that. So now, for I just want to give you an example. So the Home Office have been... Uh, ha- have been criticised over woefully understating asylum budgets. So an IFS, that's the Institute for the uh, F- Financial Study, uh, IFS, Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, report vindicates, so an independent report vindicates Labour's concerns that it has inherited a worse financial situation than previously thought. So the Home Office has been accused of submitting woeful budget figures under successive Conservative ministers, which officials are new understated the ballooning cost of asylum and illegal immigration spending in a report which, of course, would have then made the Conservatives look bad because they're supposed to be hard on illegal immigrants and if they're spending lots of money on it or trying to sort it out but failing then there would have been you know there would have been uh, far more unpopular but anyway in a report partially vindicating Rachel Reeves claim uh, that the new Labour government inherited a far worse financial situation than initially thought the Institute of Fiscal Studies think tank suggested the Home Office had repeatedly lowballed its budget estimates it found ministers new budgets it had submitted were insufficient and habitually drew on uh, treasury contingency reserves a practice that one Labour source described as like the wild west Labour said it was proof the previous government had covered up the extent of the crisis in the asylum system and that ministers ran away from the problem okay so on and so forth so that's all to do with asylum and budgets and blah 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 but the general point is that the the uk wanted and wants to do more for ukraine and it was always going to be contingent upon whether we could afford it and but this is the same for all nations but we are in a particularly bad position and you can argue what, what you can ask why we're in such a bad position I would argue, but then you could, you know, this might annoy my my friendly leave voters. Uh, I would argue that Brexit has absolutely done us over. Like, and this is borne out by statistics, though. You know, there is good evidence to say that we are economically in a far worse position than we would have been, precisely because we opted out of the EU. And as a result, we are now outside of a, the big, one of the biggest trade blocks in the world, if not the biggest. And we are having to negotiate deals as a minnow in a big sea of much larger fish now, and or 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 in a in a sea where, in order in order to do those deals, we are no longer in a massive position of a, a block of five hundred million of some of the richest, most powerful countries in the world, where we can do trade deals with other nations that would be to the benefit of the EU. We've subsequently done trade deals with Japan, with Australia, New Zealand, and all those trade deals have been admitted by the Conservative government that did it, by the minister that actually did the trade deals as being what's the term? It's something like absolutely rubbish or whatever, whatever it was. Though our trade deals have been poor because we are no longer in that powerful position we've opted out of that powerful position and now we're sat there on our own trying to negotiate all these trade deals that take years and years to do and as a result we aren't we are not uh deriving the benefits from doing uh doing trade with these countries that we previously would have have enjoyed and so we are in a bad position although our economy is actually slightly okay at the moment we're doing slightly better lots of reasons for that but think of how it would be had we been enjoying the 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 benefits of being within the eu would be my argument but either way the uk is in in a very tough financial position and when you're looking at things like uh needing to spend uh three percent of gdp on defense then that's even less likely but yet again, it goes back to the idea that, well, every country is in this, in this problem of not having enough money. And it, if you put the priority high enough that, that, you know, Ukraine is that important, then actually, you know, that's where we should be spending. So, yeah, all very difficult. Anyway, just just to give you the, the context that the, the UK is financially buggered at the moment, 
more than it was thought to have been. So yeah, that, that's your context. Okay, I'm going to leave you on something genuinely positive. You know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade here. So here is a si sound of uh, air raid sirens and someone obviously with a very good singing voice putting those air sirens to a more positive use. And there you go. Take care, everybody. Speak soon. Toodle. Pips.